Okay, turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40, and we will look at 40, 41, and 42, three chapters this evening to begin this new section of Isaiah. Chapter 39 ended the first section of the book of Isaiah, the two-thirds of it. The next third will be dealing with uh, uh, something totally different, something totally new, new subject and so forth. Um, that will be dealing with future events, and that is our Savior Jesus Christ and all the particulars that surround Him. And so we start with chapter 40 and through 66. Now Jesus quotes uh, Isaiah here in both sections of Isaiah to basically reveal to us as readers that the book of Isaiah is authentic. It is the Word of God. And Jesus, quoting from both sections of Isaiah, proves that fact. He gives it uh, the authority and, and validity that uh, it comes from God and that the scriptures written there are good enough uh, to share with uh, his audience at his time. And so some that say that Isaiah is written by two different authors just isn't true. Jesus didn't have that problem, didn't say that this is the second author of Isaiah. He just quoted it as though it was one author. And when you really look at the Bible, you know that the whole book is really really uh, authored by one person, and that is God himself, as he wrote through men. I love the Bible. It is just an amazing book. When you get into it and read it, it just blows you away how it touches on subjects in your life uh, that you're dealing with at that moment. And it just seems like it's alive. And God just happens to minister to you at that moment with those difficulties and those struggles or those decisions that you have to make. They're just there. And God ministers to you right at that very moment because it is alive, and he's speaking to us through his word. As you study Genesis through Revelation, and you realize that as you're studying that this is one book, really with a bunch of books in it, but it just flows so evenly. The Old Testament speaks a lot about Israel, and so Isaiah's dealing with Israel. In these next few chapters, we're going to see that Jesus will be dealing with the Gentiles, talking about future events. And when you get to the New Testament, and after Acts chapter 9, I believe it is, when the uh, person who was a religious man, Saul, all of a sudden becomes Paul, and he becomes the minister to the Gentiles. And then the Gentiles are then ministered to and salvation is brought to the Gentiles and to the rest of the world. And God then begins to minister to the church. And there's a flow from the Old Testament God dealing with Israel and the New Testament God dealing with the church and it just flows right into it because Israel rejected Jesus Christ, wouldn't receive his message that he was the Messiah and so they crucified him and Jesus then gave the message to Paul to spread to the rest of the world. And we call it the, the age of the Gentiles or the church. And when that age is done, then God, Romans chapter 11, tells us that God then will return to Israel and begin to minister to them once again. And so we see this flow through the whole Bible. And it's just amazing because you see one author. And those that protest against the word of God and, and, and use and shout all of these negative uh, reports about it really haven't read the Bible. They may have read a verse out of its context and so forth, but they really haven't read through the Bible and really, really tried to understand it within its context. If they did, they would come to know that, uh, that God is alive and that he sits on the throne and that he did send his son Jesus Christ to die for the sins of the world. And so we start with Isaiah chapter 40, this new section, and God begins to proclaim comfort for his people. Now, there's only so much that a person can take. And I think God knows that. You can only take so much pain and so much suffering before something happens to you. I was reading an article about Pastor Bob Coy and some of the things surrounding him. And there's a lot more to it than, than just what was reported. 
And then this article was talking about several other pastors who had also fallen. And I remember uh, another pastor, Pastor Ted, a part of the faith movement had fallen too into homosexuality. And there was a process of trying to restore him. But then there was only so much that he could take and he ended up hanging himself. There's only so much that a person can take. And I think God knows that. There's a point where he comes in and he rescues you. you Those that are are his children and those that are really calling out and crying out to him for forgiveness and repentance and hope that God would do something. And so God is going to comfort the children of Israel because he sees that that they've had enough. (laughs) They've struggled enough. They've been in bondage enough. And so it's time to restore them. So he says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her welfare is, or warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Uh, that's refreshing there. That gives you hope that your iniquity is pardoned. When you, when you understand sin and the result of sin, as the New Testament teaches, that The result of sin is always death and struggles and pain and so forth. And that's the result of every sin that we commit. When someone offers pardon for that sin, that's good news. That you're not held guilty for that sin. How many times have we sinned and then have been looking behind our shoulders waiting for that person to bust us because we know we've sinned and we know that we're going to get in trouble any minute from now because we've sinned. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and you got away with it. And you feel this sense of burden lifted from you, because you're like, oh, whew, boy, did I get away with that one. You know, and it's not going to come back and haunt me. Well, that sensation, that feeling, that burden is lifted off of you when you realize that God has pardoned your iniquities. And iniquities are, are sins that you commit knowingly out of rebelliousness towards God, and yet he has forgiven you. And he's forgiven Israel here, saying their warfare is going to end, their iniquities will be pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. In other words, they were chastised good. God really corrected them, gave them double than normal. That hurts. <laughs> That's not pleasant, I'm sure. And God's heart was crushed. And he poured out compassion towards them. And that's the kind of God we have. A God of compassion and love. He, I don't think that he enjoys correcting us or disciplining us. I think it hurts him deeply to do so. And he's looking to pardon us and forgive us if we're willing to confess our sins. As First John 1, 9 tells us, then he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. You know, and forget our sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. That's the God that we serve who's willing to forgive us and bring compassion. And that's only done for us through Christ Jesus our Lord because of our faith and trust in Him and Him alone. His death on the cross was sufficient. It was enough. His blood that was shed, uh, the pain and the suffering, uh, the rejection by His Father and Him going to the pit of hell to release those that were captive, that was enough to pardon us from our iniquities. More than enough that we could never do anything. And now Isaiah looks to the future especially pertaining to John the Baptist. And he says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now we know in the New Testament, especially Mark chapter 1, it begins with the whole story of John the Baptist. uh, One who wore camel's uh, clothing and was out in the wilderness like a wild man eating grasshoppers and and honey and, and so forth. And he came for one purpose, and that was to cry out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, to make straight the desert a highway for our God. He was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. In fact, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he proclaimed the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And Isaiah is prophesying him coming, just as Malachi also prophesied concerning him coming. Now it's interesting because you think of John the Baptist and you think his ministry is over. You know, he proclaimed the way of the Lord, and that's true, and Elijah needed to come first, and John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way. But aren't we still preparing the way for people? Aren't we still making 
crooked paths straight? Isn't that still our calling? To water and to plant seeds, you know? To reach out to the lost? Doesn't it seem harder today than ever before? It sure does. People's hearts are so hardened to the gospel, to the message. It's almost like God has put a veil upon the United States for some reason. Oh, we're seeing the mega churches having outreaches with multitude of decisions made for Christ, but yet we're not seeing the commitment to repent and turn from that old lifestyle to God, to leave that old lifestyle. The percentage is a lot less than what we're seeing. What we're seeing on the outside at at these mega um, crusades and, and evangelist outreaches are really not what's happening in the heart of people. We're seeing less of it. Uh, we're seeing less of what Paul said in Galatians, you know, that people need to turn from the works of the flesh. Because the works of the flesh, he says at the very end there, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you practice these things, and there are those who are Christians, calling themselves Christians, and yet they're practicing worldly sins. They're involved with those things, and they think that they're Christians going to heaven. And Paul says, no. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And that's even anger, a person that gets angry all the time. It says anger and hatred will not inherit the kingdom of God if you practice that. If you're not fighting against it. If you're not taking every precaution to stop. That's also heresy and gossip. You know, if you're out there doing that and you practice those things, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Because this is the sinful nature that you're catering to. And a man that's born again is a new creature in Christ Jesus. And the old things pass away. There has to be a conversion over to Christianity. There has to be a desire to do what is right. And there just doesn't seem to be that desire. Oh yeah, I accepted Christ. I confess Him as my Lord and Savior, but I'm still living with my boyfriend. We're not married yet, but one day we're going to get married. So really, we don't, you know, there, there seems to be this, this trend today with Christians is we don't believe in paper. Just because a government gives us a piece of paper says that we're married, you know, I don't believe that. I believe that we're married, even though we haven't gotten married. You know, and that's crazy. The excuses that we use to justify our living conditions. And a lot of Christians are living together, proclaiming that they're Christians and they're on their way to heaven. And that's just far from the truth, according to Galatians chapter 5. No, we're to make straight the crooked ways. We're to let people know that you need to repent. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, what was the message of John? Look at verse 6. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all its loveliness is like flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You get this picture? Humanity is like grass. It grows within one week and you chop it down. And you take the clippings and you throw it in the waste can. That's how humanity is. They're here one moment, and in 70 years, they're gone. And the next person is born, and in 70 years, they're gone. They're like grass. They wither away. But what stands forever is the Word of God. The Word of God. I love that phrase, because again, it reminds me how important the Word of God is to us. And if anything, if we had no ministries here whatsoever... The greatest ministry would be the Word of God. If we did not have any men's, any women's, the ministry would be Sunday morning teaching the Word of God. Wednesday evening teaching through the Word of God. And we should be hungering for the Word of God. I believe that we're a little fat from the Word of God too. We have a lot of good teaching out there on the radio. And we've replaced Sunday mornings and Wednesdays with Well, I get the radio every day. Hey, we should be in the Word every day. 
doesn't replace Sundays and Wednesdays. It just means we're in the Word every day. David says he wakes up in the morning, every morning, to worship the Lord, to pray to the Lord, to seek the Lord, and to read His Word. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every day. Every single day. And so, just because we have all the Word of God coming at us from different angles, from different books, and radio, and television, and and, and mp3s and and your youtube and all of these different avenues wonderful and it's great but it doesn't replace the sundays and wednesdays we need to be in church and we need to be hungering for the word of god how do you hunger for the word of god well for one is you need to pray and say lord i'm not hungering for your word as i used to would you help me hunger for your word help me to desire it it's almost like we want candy instead of good food. It's easy to take a bite of candy, fill your tummy in, and you go off. But to eat good food takes discipline, takes strength. And it just seems like we don't have that anymore because we have so much out there. Everything else will wither, but the Word of God stands forever. Jesus said not one dot, not one tittle will pass away. That's how important the Word of God is. It really is important. And we should be anticipating the Lord speaking to us when we come on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays. We don't come, if I can talk to you frankly from my heart, guys, ladies, we don't come here to put in our time card in a religious way. Oh, I did my Wednesday night. You know, wonderful. We come here to first worship our God, and that's why we get here on time. So that we spend time in worship, preparing our hearts, cultivating it, getting into the throne room of God. Hebrews tells us that, that we enter into the throne room of God where we find grace and mercy in time of need. And and as we're there, we're we're laying all our needs and concerns before Him. And and we're getting in tune. We're, We're cultivating the Spirit moving within us. And that's why it's so important that we don't have distractions. We're not thinking about other things. We're here to say, Lord, I want to just worship you. Oh, but I worship in my car on the way to work. Wonderful. It doesn't replace Wednesdays and Sundays. It doesn't replace it. We come here to hear from the Word of God. God has always used that means all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When He wanted His Word taught, who did He send? Prophets. And who did prophets go to? The people. And the people listened. Oh, how we need to be like Nehemiah's time. When, when the Nehemiah sat and began to read the word of God and it took all day and they stood there and they were rejoicing in hearing the word of God. Now, the, one of the reasons why is because they didn't have the word of God for many years. They had lost it because of the um, um, persecution and the captivity that they were in. And when they rebuilt the temple, they found the word of God and they began to read it and they were rejoicing. I think sometimes we need to realize how precious the word of God is, you know, and it's available to us. It's alive, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to discern the very thoughts and hearts of our of our beings, you know, and, and we need to understand that when we come to worship the Lord, and then to hear from the Lord, speak to me, Lord, you know the things that I'm going through, speak to me, tell me something, give me direction, expect something. And that's why it's important that we don't have distractions, that we're not distracting one another. That's why it's important that we don't, you know, there are some people that love to go to church and they're so dressed up that they become a distraction. And it's important that we just come casually to hear the word that we're not going to distract people from the word of God or making noise or getting up and down and so forth because the word of God is forever. Everything else will wither away, but the word will last forever and ever. That's what Isaiah is saying here in verse eight. The word of our God, it's God's word and it's a word to us and we need to hunger for that word. And so God sends out an invitation to behold our beautiful God. He says, O Zion, and that is Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. 
Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. In other words, you know, again, the importance of the word of God and that you're in Jerusalem and that you're worshiping the Lord and that you're focused on Him and that you lift your voice up to Him and Him alone and no others. Oh, we lift up our voices to secular music and we scream loud at a favorite song. And one of my favorite songs is that song, Happy. It's just, it's just such a unusual song and it just gets you to think about man i just want to be happy (laughs) i just want to enjoy life i want to be at peace but do we do that with worship do we lift up our voices unto the lord because he truly deserves it because he's coming back one day look at verse 10 behold the lord god shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him behold his reward is with him and his work before him I don't think that we really believe that he's coming back. The Catholic Church just said that Jesus is not returning. They just made that proclamation. Jesus isn't returning. They become preterists. That's what preterism believes. That Jesus returned back when they were persecuted in AD 70. And that we're living in the millennium age. Again, that's, that's so hard. So hard to understand because there's still so much persecution and the church is not in control at all. And when you read about the millennium age, the church is in control. Jesus is on the throne ruling and reigning. And that's just not happening. But they're preaching that Jesus is not returning. And so people are so confused. They don't believe that he's returning. So if he's not returning, we're only living for now. And so you might as well enjoy it before you die. There's no hope of his returning. There's no, there's no preparation for his returning. You're, you're not expecting him like a thief in the night. You're not you know, looking behind your shoulder to keep you in line and accountable to the Lord because he's not returning. You're going to live your life out and you're going to die and you get buried. And so you don't have to worry about him coming and, and finding you in, in a certain state. You just have to get right before you die and then everything will be fine. And it's so easy to believe that than the truth that he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to judge. Now Isaiah says he's a loving shepherd. He's coming back, and he's coming back with great love. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. And we're seeing that in 1 Peter chapter 5, right? Hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll we'll see the great shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd, and he's the one that feeds us all. Here Isaiah says that he's a shepherd, and he feeds his flock. See, it's the Lord who feeds us. And so we need to pray to the Lord, Lord, would you feed us your word? Would you, through the Holy Spirit, feed me? Feed me some truth. I don't want new truth or new revelation. I just want to know what you're saying here to me today in my situation. I want you to encourage me and strengthen me. That, Lord, that I do hunger for your word. And that's great because I'm right on. And it's wonderful to read your word. We had devotions this morning and it was great to to see in the scriptures. And I've read the scriptures, I don't know how many times where they question Jesus about paying taxes. <laughs> and he sends Peter off to fish and he catches a fish and there's coin in the fish's mouth. What a beautiful story that is. But as we were discussing it, we all kind of just started sharing a little bit and we all came to the conclusion that when we have faith in Jesus Christ, when we trust in him, he, he takes care of our needs. We can trust in him and in his work. You know, Jesus Christ is the one that uh, provides for us, you know, even taxes. We don't, have to, we don't have to worry about offending people or, or, or worry about what they think of us. We just need to do the right thing. And it was just so encouraging to listen to that. It's like, that's right, Lord. And it reminded me again, just stick on the path. You know, God is the one that provides for us. Here he reminds us, it's God who teaches us. He will gather the lambs uh, with his arms, and you see this loving, caring a shepherd and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands measured heavens with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance i mean this is the god that we serve and he measures everything with the span of his hands uh, it reminds me of the psalms 23 we all love that psalms right The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. You know, 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy staff and thy rod, they comfort me. And then he says, I prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever with my shepherd. It's a beautiful song, a beautiful shepherd. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Now, God here is basically saying, look at God's wisdom. It's God's wisdom. It's amazing that we think we know better than God. I sometimes think I know better than God. We all fall into that trap. God, if you would only do this. God says, I have a different plan. Trust in me. But God, if you did it this way, if you would just help me out here. God says, look, who are you to direct me? Who are you, the creation, to tell the creator, why have you created me this way? Who are you? That's what Paul said. He says, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Have you directed the spirit of the Lord? Oh boy, we try to do that every day. The Lord's leading me over here. The Lord's leading me to do this. And we're directing the spirit instead of allowing the spirit to direct us. That's a big difference, isn't it? Being directed by the Spirit or being, or you being directing the Spirit. Big difference. When I get up in the morning, I say, Lord, lead me today. And that's basically saying, Spirit, lead me today. You lead me and you help me to handle whatever comes my way. I'm open to whatever direction that you're leading. But he's asking the question. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Has anybody directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or as, or as his counselor has taught him anything? Has anybody taught God anything? I mean, does God need to be taught? I don't think so. With whom did he take counsel? Did anybody counsel him? And who instructed him? And who taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Uh, these are all questions, you know. Who directed him? Who counseled him? Who instructed him? Who taught him? Who showed him the path of righteousness? Nobody. He's God. He knows all these things. And so we can depend on him to have all the wisdom and counsel that we need. We can trust in him completely because our God is great. Our God is great. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket compared to our God. You take all the world today, you take the president and all his counselors, and then you take all of the prime ministers of the world and other nations and you put them all together and their wisdom's a drop in the bucket compared to our God. That's the truth. And are counted as the small dust on the scale. The small dust. <clears throat> Scales at those times, you know, you, you had this balance. Uh, you usually had this little bar that stretched straight out and on top of that bar you had a, an arm that balanced on on that bar and two little plates on each side and and with nothing on it the scale should balance completely even they'd be totally leveled now when you buy and sell uh, let's say that you had gold and you wanted to you know weigh the gold so you put you know a little weight on one and so it would drop down you put the gold on the other side and you would bring it till it balanced you go, okay, that's how much I have. This much weight, that's how much gold I have because it balanced out. What he's saying here is that, that God, he said, are counted as a dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. The dust itself, if, if, if you got scales, you bring it out and someone wants to weigh it, uh, and all of a sudden they look at the scales and then you go up to the scales and you go... <laughs> And you take the dust off the scales. And they're going, wow, that's a righteous man. He doesn't want to rip me off at all. He's taking the dust off the scales so he gets a good, accurate reading. You know, uh, what they were doing was when they had a, an ounce weight, it was really less than an ounce or more than an ounce, depending on how they wanted to cheat somebody. And that's how they would cheat you. And so this was a righteous man, but that's nothing compared to the Lord. He lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. 
All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. Wow, that really describes our value, isn't it? I mean, it's like we're nothing. The nations are nothing compared to God. God is everything. God is the only thing. God is the only one. Did he have to create us? No. Yet he created the heavens and the earth and he created us in his likeness that he could have a relationship with us. But he is above all things and there is no one like him. And there is no nation that is greater than him and neither are we greater than him. And yet sometimes we think we are. And I'm so glad that he's so great that he ignores the fact that we think we're great. (laughs) That he loves us enough to understand that we're not so great and that he is beyond that. And that we don't move him in a negative way because of that. That he loves us still that much more. You know, man's best just isn't enough for God. And so he sent his son because he knew that. We just couldn't do enough. Couldn't do enough righteousness. Couldn't perform enough work. And so that's why we come and we just worship the Lord. And we hear his word in awe of who he is. So he moves on, Isaiah, and he talks about how great God is and how it surpasses everything, even idols. He says, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare him to? The workman molds an image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not rot, so hard wooden. But how can you compare wood with God who is alive? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And his inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like tents to dwell in. He brings the prince to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also bow on them, or blow on them, and they will wither. Again, these are the nations and their rulers, and yet what he's saying, they're like grass, and I will just blow on them, and they'll wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? In other words, the, the angels of heaven. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. No one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Now he's coming to Israel and Jacob, and he's saying, so why do you guys speak? Why are you trying to defend? Why are you trying to give me your wisdom? Why are you trying to help me understand? Why are you giving me counsel? Why are you even talking? You have something to say? Not much. He says, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just calm has, is passed over by him. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. Boy, God is unsearchable. We can never know God. And yet we can know God through his scriptures, but yet we really don't fully know him. There's so much of him that we don't know. Isaiah will teach on that line again in chapter 55 when he talks about God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways for they're higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts in other words they're uncomprehendable you can't understand why he's doing anything and yet it's so hard for us isn't it as as human beings to trust in the Lord yet knowing that he has everything in the palm of his hand and yet we struggle with trusting in him that he has our best interests that is really difficult for us to do, to understand and know that he has us right where he wants us and he has our best interest at hand. I think that's the hardest thing for any of us. When we make decisions, you know, in our relationships, you know, we marry somebody and then all of a sudden we're going, 
I think I made the wrong decision. And yet God put you there for a reason. Because God laid it on your heart at that moment, at that time, to marry that individual. And you did. And you're there. And now you have to work out your relationship because God's working out the flaws in you, not in them, in you. It's always you first. Always. Corinthians 15. You know, examine yourself first. It always starts with you first. And then them is God's problem, not yours. God is unsearchable and he knows what he's doing in your life. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he's doing it according to his will. He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And I claim that promise tonight. (laughs) Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. So there's a difference there. The youth will faint and they'll grow weary because they're not trusting in the Lord. They're not trusting in the Lord. Why do men fall? Why did this pastor hang himself? Because he wasn't trusting in the Lord. Why did it go to that end? Because they were growing faint and weary. Instead of believing in God that he had a purpose and a plan through it all, they got tired and bring their own destruction. Now we come to chapter 41. One commentary said that this is a court scene. Uh, God calls all the Gentile nations to stand before the bar of judgment. And God is the judge and persecuting attorney and the jury here. So let's read it. Keep silence before me, O coastlands or distant lands. In other words, the surrounding nations. And let the people renew their strength. Let them come near. Let them, or then let them speak. Let us come near together for judgment. In other words, he's saying, come near, all you nations, get over here, tell me what's going on, because I'm about to judge you. We're in court, and I'm prosecuting you, and I'm jury, and you're judged. And he has that right, because he's God, and he knows all things. So God reasons with them. Who 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 raised up one from the east? Who in righteousness called him to his feet? Who gave the nations before him and made him ruler over kings? Who gave them as a dust to his sword, as driven stubble to his vow? Now, who is he talking about here? It's not Jesus Christ. He's talk, most commentators believe it's King Cyrus. And this is 150 years earlier before he came into existence. And God is talking about it to let them know that this is going to happen. And it's God who's raising him up. So, who pursued them and passed him safely by the way? And had gone with his feet. Who has performed and done it? Now notice the who's here as we're reading this. And the eyes. Who has performed and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I the Lord am the first. And with the last I am he. The coastland saw it and feared. The ends of the earth are afraid. They drew near and came. Everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with... Smooth with the hammer inspired him who strikes the veil, saying, It is ready for the soldier, or the soldering. Uh, Then he fastens it with pegs that it might not totter. But you, again that person, Cyrus, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from the furthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. So he's judging all the other nations around him, but yet his servant Israel he is not done with. And here's the promises. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Notice the I am's and I will's. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existing thing. Now think about some of the nations that came up against Israel. Where are they today? 
They're not around. So is God true to his promise? Yes, he is. Is God going to take care of us? Yes, he is. And he's going to do the same to you too. You're his children. We are the church and the same is true of him. Don't fear because he's with you. He's your God. He'll strengthen you. He'll help you. He'll uphold you. These are promises to us. For I am the Lord your God, will, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm Jacob. <laughs> I love that. Humbling Jacob. Look, you're just a worm, but I'm going to help you because I love you and because I'm great. You men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, reminding them who's redeeming them. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge and sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like shaft. You shall willow them, the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And he's talking about the nations again, and he's using Israel as a judgment tool. You shall rejoice in the Lord and the glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and the needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongue fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the middle of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedars and the acacia trees, the myrtle and the oil trees. I will set in the desert cypress trees and pine trees and the box trees together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Has that come to pass? It has. 1948, when God fulfilled this promise and brought Israel back to the land. Before that, it was just a desert. You go there today, there are trees all over the place. There's produce all over the place. Back in 2013, farming and agricultural production in Israel, which is an industrial country, accounts for 2 to 3% of the GMP, the gross natural product. Major produce includes vegetables, cotton, beef, poultry, dairy products, citrus, and other fruits. Israel total exports for in 1999 were $25 billion in exports. And they exported all across the world. You go there today and it's beautiful. It's like California, if not even better. The soil is perfect. And God is saying here, I did it all. And yet you look at it and you go, Israel went into the land, they took it over and they began to use technology and God giving them this technology and this wisdom to create everything that they have. You know, when I was over there, I think we were in Capernaum and they went into the restrooms and I, I went and used the restrooms, but there were no flushing mechanism on them. They're all airless. They created these systems that use no water. You know, I thought, wow, and it's to conserve water because they need to conserve water over there. They're one of the leading manufacturers of the drip system. They're the ones that started that. And so every plant has tubing and drip system right to the plant so they're not wasting it on any other part. You know, their technology is amazing in how they do things. God said he did that, that he put it in their hearts, that he laid it in that technology. He gave them that wisdom. He does the same thing with us too when we call out to him and ask him for that wisdom and that understanding and the things that we deal with. Let me say it this way. He wants to do it. It's up to us to ask him and then receive it. He goes on and says, Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come Hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. I have raised up one from the north against Cyrus, and he shall come from the rising of the sun. He shall come on my name, and he shall come against prince as though mortar, as the potter treads clay, who has declared from the beginning that we may know in former times that we may say he is righteous. Surely there is no one who shows. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. The first time I said to Zion, look, there they are. And I will give to Jerusalem 
one who brings good tidings. For I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them, but there was no counselor. Who then, who, when I asked of them, could answer a word? Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. And so there was no one there. Their idols were nothing. Their wisdom was nothing, and none could help. And so he has to help. And so what does he do? He brings the servant, Jesus Christ. And then we have a song about Jesus in chapter 42, the servant Jesus Christ. Look at his character. Behold my servant. Notice the capital S, speaking of Jesus Christ there, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I put my, or I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Highlight that. To who? The Jews. No, the Gentiles. Again, he's going to reach out to the Gentiles through the Apostle Paul. That is us, the non-Jews. You see the relationship of the Father and the Son here and how he loved the Son, and yet he loved us to give his Son. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. When Jesus came, he came very lowly, very humble. He didn't come out screaming and yelling, I'm the Messiah, you better believe in me. He just calmly came. In fact, his brothers even urged him, why don't you go down make yourself known? He says, no, it's not my time. You guys go home. I'm, the, I'm just going to wait back here and I'll just sneak in. You know, that's Jesus. He doesn't force us. He doesn't push us. He allows us to use our free will. He wants us to love him. He wants us to respond in love. And no other thing. He's not going to force you to love him. He's not going to do that. He, he doesn't want to do that. He's a gentle gentleman. And he loves you and continues to love you unconditionally. And he just waits for you to respond to that love. That's how he acts. And that's what Isaiah is saying here. A bruised reed, he will not break. A smoking flax, he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Again, his character of gentleness. If there's a bruised reed, he's not going to break it off. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. So all nations will wait for him. That will be the day when all nations and all people will be waiting for Jesus. I mean, almost anticipating, okay, Lord, tell us what you want. And we'll do it. And so his promise here to his servant. Thus says, God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I mean, you see the work of the Lord in humanity, in the earth, in creation, everything. He, he created the earth. He stretched it out. He, he gives the breath that we have. The breath that we're breathing right now is given to us by God. Do you know that if you try to stop breathing, God won't allow you to? You know what will happen? You'll faint, and then you'll start breathing. Try it. No, don't, not now. Wait till, till after. But if you decide, I'm holding my breath, you know, and you hold it, you'll faint, and then you'll start breathing because it's God who gives you the breath. You're not in control of that at all. God is in total control of that. That's an amazing thing. I mean, years ago, someone came up to me and said, could you pray for my grandmother? She's passing away. And she's in the hospital now. She just went in. And the Lord just laid on my heart. You know, I'm, I don't always know what to pray for. But the Lord just laid on my heart. So I prayed and I said, Lord, would you take her home? It's time. She's already 89 years old. She's in bed all day long. People are catering her and working around her. And now she's in the hospital and she's ready to go home. She said herself she wants to go home. So I didn't pray for healing. I didn't pray for strength. I didn't pray for wisdom of the doctors. I just said, Lord, would you take her home? And then that person was so upset at me. And they didn't tell me right at that moment. They told me later on. But they came and told me because when they went home and they called... She had passed away the very minute that we were praying. And so she knew that the Lord wanted her to go home. And so she told me that, that I was upset, but then when she passed exactly when we were praying, I knew it was the Lord's will. You know, it's the Lord's will. Just because I pray it doesn't mean it will happen. 
had nothing to do with me. I just happened to be praying the Lord's will at the moment, you know, and it was the Lord's will that he take her and he did. So if I pray that for you, you know, if <laughs> it's not because you're going to go, it's whatever the Lord's will is. And that's ultimately the case, right? We want the Lord's will because it's the Lord who gives us breath. It's the Lord that keeps us alive. You know, I was telling that to Lonnie. Lonnie's in the hospital and his heart rate heart rate was irregular and so he ended up in the hospital and it's like we're all in agreement you know hey you're not ready yet you're doing better god says no it's not time still some work for you to do he's still not ready to go it's the lord who gives us breath takes our breath i the lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand i will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another. Notice that and highlight it. Nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before the sp- they spring forth, I tell you, of them. In other words, I'm prophesying to you before they even happen. One of the things is that God will not give his glory to anyone. Chuck was really adamant about not taking glory from the Lord in anything. He just wouldn't. If you would say to him, you know, Chuck, you did a good job. He's like, the Lord did a good job. It was always the Lord. And I'm like that too, because I know what the scriptures say. He doesn't give his glory to anyone. And for me to say that I did this, I didn't do a thing. People in the past have been in this church and have tried to direct it to grow, thinking that it's going to grow because of them. And it doesn't work like that. It just doesn't work like that. Now, if it grows because of them, it's because of the Lord, not them. People think they have the answer. If you just do this, it'll grow. That's not what the Bible said. Acts chapter 2 said, if we fellowship, if we get into the Word, if we get into the Word, Sundays and Wednesdays, if we have fellowship with one another and we keep the Word, then the Lord adds to the church, right? We think, a lot of people think, well, if we have Sunday and Wednesday and we have a men's and a women's and a new believers and a singles and we have a homeless and we have this and we outreach there and, and we have this outreach over there, but then it's going to grow. That's not what the Bible said. It's not what the Bible said at all. It said if we keep God's word Sunday and Wednesdays, you know, every day we keep his word and we worship him and we are obedient to him and we fellowship, one true fellowship I'm talking about, true fellowship, not hanging around each other and going fishing. I'm talking about fellowship in the Lord, praying for one another, you know, um, concern for one another, helping each other's needs and so forth. Then it grows. Why is that? Because people see the love of God there instead of just works. You can do a lot of works, a lot of works, but that's all it is. It's a lot of works. And there's no love and there's no fellowship. You're just performing tasks and then you're getting done with those tasks and then you're going home. It's the fellowship and the love within that that causes people to grow. I, I really think that our church is in a phase right now where we have a lot of new people coming and they're not quite sure of us yet. And it's up to us to reach out and get them in the fellowship. And they're just not doing that. And we're struggling with getting them in the fellowship. Not just saying, hi, how are you, and and so forth, but getting them to come on Wednesday nights, getting them to get involved. This is the first time in 19 years, you know, we've had this uh, sign-up sheet for this little outreach coming up this coming Saturday, and we hardly have any names on there. And usually we have the thing packed out on the list. Because it's all the people that have been here in the past and not the new people. Because we're missing something, that fellowship and getting them in to the ministry. And we need to bring them in that way, the fellowship. Not all these other gimmicks. Because it's God who does the work. 
He goes on, talks about the work of the Lord's servants. Sing to the Lord a new song in his praises from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it. You coastlands and you inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. The villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Shil sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praises in the coastlands. The Lord shall bring... The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yet shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have held my peace a long time. I have been still and restrained myself, but I will cry like a woman in labor. I will plant and grasp at once. I will lay waste the mountains of the hills and dry up all the vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands. And I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed who trust in carved images, who say to the molded images, you are my gods. In other words, they will become born again. I'm going to turn them back and they're going to see again and they're going to understand things. In fact, they're going to be ashamed that they even believed in idols, that they trusted in other things. Hear you deaf and look you blind, and he's speaking to Israel here, that you may see so many are blind and deaf and not physically, spiritually. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but you do not observe, opening the ears, but do not hear. Boy, that is our world today, isn't it? That is our world today. It's so evident, but we're not obeying. It's so evident and we're not hearing. It's so easy to see, but we're not seeing it. Just kind of like the times of... uh, the religious leaders with Jesus. Jesus stood right in front of them, the Messiah, and they could not see him. They could not hear him. And he judged them for that. The Lord is well pleased for his righteous sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. But this is the people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes, and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey, and no one delivers, for plunder, and no one says restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers? Was it not the Lord? He against whom he has sinned. For they, have, or for they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his laws. Therefore, he has poured on him the fury of his anger and the strength of his battle. It has set him on fire around all, or all around. Let, yet he did not know, and it burned him, yet he did not take it to heart. It's the Lord who judges them. Quickly turn to Second Chronicles. I just want you to see something. 7.14. And then we'll end right here. Chapter 7, verse 14. We all know the scripture, but I want you to highlight something. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven or then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now, what's the goal? Healing their lands, right? Healing their lands. That's what our nation needs is a healing of our land. Now, how will the healing of the lands come? If they humble themselves, who? God's people, not the world, not the nations, not the president, not Israel, not Russia, not these other nations. He's talking to his people here, Israel, to us. If they humble themselves, if they pray, are we praying? If they seek his face, are we really seeking his face? If they turn from their wicked ways, have we really repented from our wicked ways? If they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. He says if we do these things, our land will get healed. So what are we lacking? Either we're still living in our wicked ways. I really think that's what it is. 